Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Paul and Vince's Excellent Hobby Adventure. And I didn't sing it this time because we have special guests with Paul ready to sing this. So, Paul, take it away, man. Today, we're lucky enough to be graced by Dobby the House Elf and her sister. <laughs> so, what, what do you guys have to say for us? Paul and Vince, hobby time, excellent. Yeah. Yes. I need to record. I'm going to go in and edit it and pull that sound clip out. <laughs> and we're going to do just that as our intro for everything from now on. That's, nice. that's right there. All right. So, yes, welcome back, everybody. Here we are, another hobby adventure. Uh, it's been two weeks since we talked to you last. And as we all remember, our challenge was painting a whole unit, factory painting a unit, as it were. So, Paul, I got, I got your stuff. Uh, are, are you ready to share? Are you, are you ready to share? what you did, what you've done. Are you so, proud of yourself? I, I'm ready to share. Look, you can chalk this up as a failure, but I think this was a great success. Honestly, <laughs> I'm really happy with where I am. All right, so we all knew that Vince was gonna come out on top in terms of sheer quantity, but we all know who the quality guy is here, right? I mean, so we gotta have, you know, the batch painter, the guy who, you know, gets it done, gets it by. And then we gotta have, you know, the Slayer Sword guy on the show who's gotta oh. you know, bring it home. <laughs> Slayer Sword. How many of those are back on your wall? I mean, I imagine that there's a couple. Sure, just they're hidden around. They're hidden around. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Sure they're probably here when I moved in somewhere. That makes sense. Absolutely. All right. Well, painting uh, painting competition winning records aside uh let's jump right into it so let's uh let's see what we got and look what i'm gonna do i locked the screen on me before we started sharing pictures <laughs> holy crap this is already our best episode ever oh my god all right here we go oh am i starting again i feel like i start every time you are starting again do you do you not want to start i was going to start with you i mean i, I guess i figured we'd save best for last but whatever oh I figure we'll just, we'll start with yours and then we, you know, like we'll just breeze through mine because yours are so much better. So there you go. Yeah. Mm, yeah. All right. So my unit is obviously not done. <laughs> um, this is a, a unit of three mega knobs. So I am starting to pick up a little bit of 40K and I want to do some orcs because they, you know, they're stompy and fun and they got some fluffy, cool stuff. Um, and I thought I would do do a, a totally different thing here, um, just as a little backstory. What I'm doing uh, these these are going to be my pretty boys. So my my um orcs and goblins or pff, orcs and goblins boy wrong system wrong system sir. Um, my my orcs here are going to be a little bit prettier than than normal orcs. I don't want, I don't want none of that rusty crappy stuff. These guys like fighting, but they only like fighting when they're looking good. You know what I'm saying here, Vince? Absolutely. They, they, they've got style and they've got grace. I hear you. Yeah. So, so that's where we're going with this. We're going with the pretty boy boys. Um, so, so I wanted to, to, to get after it and I, and I just, I really like the look of turquoise and gold. So right now we're, we're kind of going with, uh, with turquoise and gold and we're working it up. Um, I, I really enjoyed batch painting. So obviously I assembled all three of these and, um, and sort of going, you know, just through it doing the things uh, individually. So, you know, you, you pick something and you, you go after it. So really the main thing that I spent a ton of time on in these two weeks and what I'm actually really happy with is, is obviously the armor. And that's really sort of the center point of these models as I, as I finished the armor and that nice turquoise. And I think it came out very well. So um, that's sort of what, what took a lot of my time. Um, There's a bunch of brush work, a bunch of airbrush work. Uh, so, this this was no small task in terms of time commitment. I am probably ten or twelve hours deep out of these guys, so it's not like it was uh, a lack of effort. But I feel like you know I, I bring a sense of realism to the show. Not everyone can be all Vince Van Ventrella and and pump out armies in a week. So so I re I represent the the real man's hobbyist. You know, just just not living the dream. So we we get a couple hours a night, and we we hope to get done what we can get done. And so this is where I ended up. And, and what I got to say about batch painting is I, I think that the planning, which is going to tie in nicely with our midsection, the, the planning of the miniatures is very important. You want to sort of have an idea of what you're going with to start with. And where that really came in 
was I don't know if you guys can notice I also painted some of the faces here on on the two right guys and then the left guys pretty much uh, also getting there um, in terms of faces but their little face shields was actually a separate piece and there was absolutely no reason why I needed to glue that on beforehand that could have easily been painted and then glued on and would have saved me all sorts of trouble of trying to dig in there to paint their face nicely so th th that's just an example of something that when you're assembling a model absolutely pay attention to what needs to be glued on and what doesn't and what will be beneficial for you i know there's a ton of us out there who love to just throw the model together and be able to put it on the table and play the game you know even bare plastic or partially base coated or whatever it is but sometimes if you're really going for a better paint job or something you're, you're looking forward to it, it's just very detrimental to assemble the thing wholly and that's why the arms are off is because these are very intricate models absolutely love these models but um Tons of details on there, and it was just stuff that there was going to be no way I could get to if they were on the model. So uh, I think that that's, that's a big thing. Um, and also pay attention to where your base coats are going. Um, I, I found myself, you know, sort of base coating things and then trying to get back over something and then sort of smudging over the base coat I just did. And, and that's sort of a time waste, so you know what I mean? You kind of work your way from the inside out, right? Get into those nooks and crannies, paint it really nicely up to whatever you want to do, whether that be, you know, one base coat or, you know, a couple shade layers, whatever you want to do, that's irrelevant. But get in those nooks and crannies first and then work your way outward. Don't waste time like I do, you know, working on something that you just happen to randomly pick out and then realize later that, well, I'm going to drag my brush across that trying to get to something else. So I, I think that those are some valuable lessons I learned here doing this. Um, Technique-wise, I don't think I have anything mind-blowing to share. Um, I am trying to go to probably a higher standard than most would with, with foot slogging troops, but I, I'm really trying to step back and enjoy the painting of these guys and, and, and try and fall in love with the models because 40K was never my first love, so I'm trying to make sure that, that I'm doing this for the right reasons instead of the wrong reasons of just playing something to play it. So. That's sort of why I'm taking a little bit slower here. All right. Well, I love these guys. I love your color choice. I, I like the idea of the pretty boys. Um, I think that's great. Um, so let me ask some questions. So I assume, did you start and basically, you know, so I, I think in my mind how I would be attacking this is doing all the armor first. And so yeah, I assume you laid down like a darker turquoise first. And then using your airbrush, you kind of highlighted up your points of light. Now, is that is was was that the steps? You know, did kind of all the turquoise across all three models, the deepest turquoise. Then yeah. we kind of airbrush up, and then some edge highlighting last. Like walk us through the steps. So, so steps on here were were, were a little labor intensive. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the blending was airbrush. Uh, what I do was a first airbrush step of Sotec Green. Um, so that's a GW paint that I thinned down that actually seems to work pretty well through an airbrush which I was rather surprised with um, and then I actually washed it with blue um, I did a Citadel blue wash and that's just to get in the recess to really deepen it out um, and then actually without marking anything off uh, went back through and did that turquoise again and just hit spots very lightly didn't like blast it with my airbrush just hit spots lightly so that you know the darkest recesses had that deep blue color and then most of the rest was sort of back up to that turquoise color and that's when I started really getting um, into the armor itself and really picking out the high points and the low points um, with the airbrush. And how I did that was, if Vince, actually, if you want to undo your camera or unclick your camera, let's see if I can just kind of sure. get in there real, real quick while I'm talking. Uh, whoop. Can you see that? Yes, it's a little fuzzy, there, but yes. There is an obscene amount of tape all over my desk. <laughs> gotcha. I used about a half roll of masking tape. Um, now that I'm all over the place, sorry, Vince, for distracting everyone here. No, you're fine. Um, so I use a crazy amount of tape um, to block off all those areas and get back in there with my airbrush. Now, that that was a new experience for me. I've always I've used masking. I, I really enjoyed it, and we've talked about both the, uh, what is that, the Tamiya tape, as well as uh, silly, put silly Putty for blocking. But this was taking that to, you know, 9,000. Um, I, I blocked off little parts, big parts, and really used my airbrush 
um, both for fun and for effect. And it really got in here highlighting all the way to the corners on everything. And I think with 40K, it, it really, all these flat jugged things really, really lend themselves to the airbrush. And, and I think it's a great way to go. If you're into 40K, I would absolutely look into an airbrush. I think it works phenomenally for so many things um, in that game system without all the smooth surfaces. Not that you can't do smooth surfaces or curvy surfaces with an airbrush, but I think that you know this masking stuff works really, really well in 40K. Um, and then, then I lined with an actual brush when did detail work and extra highlights with, with almost up to a bone white color um, on all the edging and things like that. So uh, definitely brush uh, for the final details and some of the recess work, um, but an airbrush for a lot of the craziness in there. Yeah, I noticed like the cuts in the armor. So I assume you went in there with sort of a, a maybe a black, dark blue or dark turquoise or dark purple, something like that. And you're you're filling in these cuts in the armor. And then you sort of took like maybe a bone white and edged out the cut to make it stand out. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. No, that's great. Now with the so if the the green was the the knobs as the as the face of the mega knobs, is that brush work there on top? Yeah, it's all brush. Gotcha. Did you uh, did you customize that helmet on there, or does he come with that Space Marine helmet? He comes with that Space Marine helmet. Nice. All right. Cool. It's, it's, very a, cool. it's a beautiful kit. Um, I have nothing bad to say about this kit. It was very time consuming because it's one of those kits that like has a bajillion effing options, which is always a fun thing as a hobbyist, right? But I mean, in a time constraint, I honestly spent probably three or four nights just putting these guys together, cleaning all the lines, and deciding what to put on them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely great kit and. Obviously, as most fantasy players know, I, it's pretty apparent that GW's you know baby is 40k at this point. I mean, maybe that'll change with Age, Age of Sigmar, but it seemed like you know their model kits are just a little bit above what the fantasy ones were for their 40k stuff. Now, do you have any of the really big stompies? Like, have you gotten one of the uh, uh, I don't know the the really super big crushy yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have a, a Gorkonaut, Morkonaut, uh, waiting. I have two Death Dreads, and I got a couple of the uh, Work Bombers coming in. Nice. Yeah, yeah. those, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. 40K with these big surfaces. You know, I see it too, actually, with Infinity a lot as well, because Infinity, you've got a lot of, like, people in sort of power armor, plate armor, big mm -hmm. flat plates and stuff like that, right? Um, any game like that, I think the airbrush is just an essential tool. I think you're absolutely right. It's not that you can't do it with a brush. It's that honestly, you're going to do it four times as fast and you're, it's going to look yeah. so much better, so much easier. I mean, it, it, it would be like, you know, it, it's like trying to use a hammer to get a screw in, right? I mean, sure you can do it, but why the hell would you just get a screwdriver and do it, you know, the easier way. Right. Um, and it, it, I don't know why some people, some people in the painting community think that that's cheating, but I think if you're a hobbyist, you know, sure, if you're a competitive painter, I guess it says something about your talent if you could do this with just a brush. But for us hobbyists, I mean, do what's enjoyable. If it's going to be labor intensive and just crappy to do it with a brush, do it with an airbrush, you know? Absolutely. Could not agree more. Both are just tools in your toolbox and should be used where appropriate. All right. Yeah, I like it. Uh, these are, these guys are coming along great. Uh, are, are their arms on separate little sticks? Uh, were, were you like painting their arm armor at the same time? Because they have their, they have like big power claws on their, on their arms, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they got, they got big power claws and weapons in there. Um, there's actually not a ton of turquoise on there. And to be honest, this, this wasn't a really crazy color combination. Again, it was just a turquoise and then a bone white. And that's, that's all the color transition was, was those two colors. Um, so along with the blue wash, obviously, but I, I actually didn't even start doing a lot of the arm work yet just because I was focusing on these parts and I can go back with those two colors and not get confused. So it was just something that, you know, I just did these to get started with, but yeah, right. the, the, the arms are definitely a, another layer of complexity. I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's another one of these things where, <laughs> There's a ton of details on these guys. It's one of those things where they, they feel like each individual one feels like a character. It's not like you're doing some, you know, a vest and then, you know, a couple of flesh washes. It's like there's a lot of crap on those things. 
Yeah, all the little, like, just looking at their faces, every one of them with all these little, you know, their little Terminator eyepieces and tubes yeah. and just stuff everywhere, yeah. Yeah, they're very cool models. I always, I, uh, you, you've got to, you got to love the orcs in 40k. Whatever you think about 40k, good or bad, come on, how can you not love the orcs? Yeah, I mean, I mean come on. Uh, come on. <laughs> Big stompy robots in crazy green guys. Let's, let's just, let's just be honest with ourselves. That's pretty fun. Their spaceships are powered by diesel. I mean, <laughs> that right there, that's, that, that one, my, that won me over. There you go. If you paint it red, it goes faster. Exactly. Why? Because they think it does. So it does. Okay. Uh, yeah, very cool. All right. Anything else you want to, you want to say about them? I think they're coming along great. Uh, I will be very interested to see them finished. I assume they're going to go up on the PMP once you're done there. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get them together. Um, one thing I will say additionally, as, as someone trying to bring this up towards my upper skill range, right? I want these guys to look nice on my skill ability. I found myself way more than with a single miniature having to step away, right? I mean, when you're doing so much surface area, especially the same thing, right? If you're, if you're doing that power armor, I'm doing something like the gold, even the gold I started in the last day or two. When you do something like that, that's all the same, Step away. If you start getting tired, don't rush something. If you're trying to get it to a level that you're that you want to up your game a little bit, definitely step away. Paint something else. You know, have a couple things on your table at once, because you will probably want to blow out your brains if you paint the same two colors for twenty hours at a time. Right. So. No, it's good advice. It's it's good advice not only during but afterward, right? Like we we've said it before, and I think it's worth mentioning again that like when you're done with something, step away, come back, look at it with fresh eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're you're going to notice little things. So yeah, it's it's good to rest and it's good to give a final vision. Like it's it's funny how much of painting is and painting well is not painting, right? And knowing yeah. when when to call it. Yeah, I I agree completely. All right, awesome. Well, I uh, I think that'd be great. Are you gonna do more more of uh, the pretty boys? Like, are you gonna have planes and stuff in the same color scheme? I think so. Um, I I like how it's coming along, so I, I might just sort of keep it. Uh, I have the flash gets, which are a bunch of pirate guys, so I haven't really looked at them quite to see how it would, it would flow. Um, we'll we'll see with those guys, but I think a lot of my big mechy stuff is probably gonna be like this. I love it, and it's like very distinct color scheme. You are, you are, you are going to be definitely stand out at a at a tournament. You drop these guys on the table. Mm -hmm. I love it. All right, very good. Uh, we'll we'll give you full credit, Paul. Even though there's no arms on these bad boys, because I, I love the work. If you're you're okay, it, 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 I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the the judges allow it. That's that's what I'll say. <laughs> no, I, I I'm being entirely honest. Like I was being facetious in the beginning with you know you know me being a better painter or anything like that but I, i'm i'm happy with where these guys are for how much effort i put in for the two weeks you know i think that they're where they should be yep no absolutely they look great um i you, you've got and, and really fantastic edge highlighting that makes me think that at some point in time we need to do like a we need to do a middle talk on edge highlighting we should note that down because there's really such a fine skill to it and honestly these guys are just a masterpiece of good edge highlighting like they pop because of it. It's, and it's, it's the kind of thing your eyes don't even really notice, right? You have to like, like I notice it because I look for it, but mm -hmm. it's easy to just look at these, especially at this, you know, sort of standard zoom where I'd be holding them away from my face and you don't even think about it, but it's really making them come together. The little edges here around the top of the outside of the, the, the armor, right. And on the cuts and on the edge of the foot here, it just makes the whole model pop to have that contrast point. Yeah, I agree. So it's, it's something that's that's worth noting in terms of, of keeping an eye on when you paint. I think it makes the the whole detail a little more apparent, right? When you're working in a tiny scale, your eye can't register at that scale. So you you need to make it very stark so your eye can register. Yep. And, and again, it's one of those things like in fantasy, you get so much less of a chance to do that, to do edge highlighting, right? Because there's so many less figs that have these big plates. But when you're in 40K, Infinity, something like that, where you got sci-fi miniatures running around in power armor, it is it is just an edge highlighting dream come true. It's a skill you better develop, right? Because that's what's going to, that's the difference between miniatures that pop and those that don't. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Well, it looks great. Well done, sir. So... 
Oh, I actually need to go. I set it up to go this direction. Did I? Where are we starting? All out of order. That's where we're starting. There oh, we go. We got the whole the whole tutorial here going. Yes. Okay. So I decided to do uh, twenty blood reavers. Uh, these are the blood reavers out of the Age of Sigmar box set. You get twenty of them. I thought, hey, I've got this whole box set. We need to do a unit. Let's do this unit. So I did some little minor conversions here and there. Uh, changed some standards around. Added another standard and you know, like a head swap or whatever. But uh, for the most part, I kept them pretty standard. Um, these guys are absolutely fantastic models. Um, and love, love or hate the game, uh, I can't say anything bad about the models. Both sides are not an army I would collect, just that's personal aesthetics. But I held them things in my hand, and I was like, these are nice models. I don't care what GW does. They're still head and shoulders above every other model company in terms yeah. of quality of miniatures. Yeah, these are just like, I mean, these are just like the basis of rank and file in this game, right? And the detail level on these guys, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And you're going to see it as we kind of as we kind of step through here, right? Um, it's it's really just crazy how, how much is on... Each guy is his own guy. Now, they actually come in pairs. So there's two that kind of look similar. but uh, And you can kind of see them interspersed. But, man, they they are a lot of fun. They're very easy to assemble out of the starter kit. Um, so, yeah, like full, full props. Um, there were a couple that didn't fit together as perfectly as I would have liked, and I noticed that later, like when I was past this point. So, like, whatever. We can, you know, that those things happen. Um, okay, so... Is that actually the first one? Yeah, that's actually the first one. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Um, so the first thing I did was airbrush on flesh. So this is um, Vallejo Game Air uh, bronze flesh tone. Uh, put over, I think, with maybe a drop or two of elf skin tone mixed in just to lighten it a tad. It mm -hmm. added a sort of a nice and a whitish color to it that I liked. And so that I started by airbrushing that onto all their skin. And so you can see that here. That just gave me a nice even coat over the brown. Uh, and then I washed that all in Reichland flesh shade. Uh, so that was sort of my first step. Uh, now, and by the way, go ahead. I, I, have, I have a quick question uh, on your feelings of, of Reichland flesh shade. I've always found it a little too red or do you go back over the top of it because I see a lot of people that kind of use it is sort of you know maybe leave it in that recess a little too much and I think it looks a little red to me for skin tones what, what are your feelings on the, on the right one flesh shade it is very ruddy you are absolutely right um, I like it very much as a flesh shade but it works best if you're doing I, I like like these guys are tan right because like these guys are out the Sun I went with like a deep already ruddy flesh tone and I think in that case, it works the best, right? Because it, it fits in with what's going on. If you tend to favor more pale skin tones, something along the lines of, you know, more like the pale flesh or, or you know, out of the game airline yeah. or uh, sunny skin tone out of the model color line, it's, it's not going to look as good, right? Um, I mean, it, it seems like, I mean, bronze flesh tone, just for people at home, what we're talking about with game air, it, it seems almost kind of like, like yellowy a little bit. Yep. You know what I mean, so that's sort of the, the color color going, and that makes sense because I mean the the I think GW flesh tone is sort of a very reddish brown more so than than the standard pale flesh tone, and that works well with a yellowy skin color. Right. Exactly. So in this case, I liked it because it was a little sharper contrast, and in, and in this case, I liked the high contrast just because. Uh, I mean, these dudes are stacked. Like, holy crap, these guys are up at 5 a.m. for PT. Like, no doubt. Look at the – these guys have got eight packs all over the place, right? I mean, they are uh, – they're not skipping leg day or arm day or anything. These dudes are built. They're, uh, skip, they're skipping days off. That's what they're skipping. That's right. Exactly. No time to rest. Got to hit the gym for corn. Uh, so just, like, the musculature on these guys and just, like, the, the stretching, like – so just like here, like this guy on the right, right here, like you can see the veins under the muscles, right? Like this, this, these muscle line stretches. I mean, the detail like here, it's just amazing. 
Like now I realize we're staring really hard at dudes' chests, but hey, that's okay. I mean, but I have a boner, so sure. So there you go. I mean, it's just that easy. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so started with the the mix of the bronze and the and the uh, elf, and just did all twenty of them. Whammo, airbrush, over all of it. Now here's a funny thing about it. You'll notice I used a brown primer, right? Now I let the primer kind of drift just a tad over some of the pants at the high points where they're sticking up. Like you can see it here, right? And I just use that later to be the highlight for the pants because I'm going to wash over the pants and even that out. Mm -hmm. And I like I'm getting a twofer here, and that's one of the keys with factory painting. You got to look at like, okay, where can I save time, right? Where can I? You got to really. We're, we're going to talk about pre-planning when you're factory painting. It's really important. You need to think about your steps, what you're doing, get your order right. Don't be going back and doing things, you know, multiple times as it were. So that's a, that was an easy twofer there. Uh, so here we go. So we highlighted the flesh back up and then put the brown straps on so you can see like where there's brown leather we picked that out as well as some black uh here and there so actual colors uh i took it just more into the elf skin tone so i had like just you know let's call it 80 20 bronze flesh and elf to start and that was just highlighted with several layers moving up with constantly adding more elf skin tone i just go through 20 i probably did let's say three full passes at them back and forth, which each with each one being two full passes around the miniature. So maybe six layers of flesh tone, right? Per, uh, per run. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So to a 50, 50, and then to a reverse, uh, 28. Um, the Brown is just the, uh, model air rust. Have you played around with the model air rust color? No, I have not. It's fantastic. It's the non-metallic. There's two model air rusts. One is metallic, one oh, is not. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, I have. Yes, yeah, it's I just have. like a super red brown, right? Yeah, yeah. And I love it. It's great for leather, for belts, for stuff like that. And then we just went for the, the old standard that I love so much, and that is the German gray out of the uh, Vallejo model color line for the, for the black. I find it to be so much better than just pure black because, you know, what, what is really pure black in the world, right? right? Pure black doesn't really, really happen that often. Right. So I always go to the German gray. It's, it's dark. It's black until you hold it next to black, right? And then you're like, oh, okay, no, that's really black. Uh, all right. So then we went through and did the silver on all the weapons. So we can see that just carved out the metal. Now, the metal was done. You're going to watch the metal change as we go over. So started out by laying down uh, the chainmail silver, which is a nice, it's not uh, out of the game airline. It's a dark sort of blackish silver. It's not bright and shining, but it's also not gunmetal out of the game airline, which is a freaking black silver. Um, this is a nice mid-range. So I started with this, then we washed that with a Nuln Oil. Then we highlighted back up with the chain mail again, thinned down with some, some uh, glazed medium. Then we washed it again with seraphim sepia to give it more of a ruddy, sort of like vaguely rusty. We wanted some color tone on the metal. That hasn't happened here yet. You'll see it in the pictures to come. Then we highlighted back up again with the chain mail and then a 50-50 mix of the chain mail and silver and then an edge highlight with just silver. So that's what you'll look at at the end. Now, also dry brushed on some light gray over the German gray. Yeah. And we went to the reds. So for the reds, we started with a, a whole red, always my favorite to base with. So you can see just picked out all the red parts. And then, like, one of the things I love about corn is he likes red, and red is the easiest color to layer in. And I actually went for a reverse sort of highlight on their helmets. So this is not actually accurate as per how the lighting would fall, right? Like the, if I was doing this properly, the tops of their helm should actually be the, the most highlighted part. Mm -hmm. But I liked the black, like I hit all the cracks with Nuln Oil to blacken them all out. And then I went over and did the red. And I like this better because I like the contrast of having the bright red at the, at the brightest point right around their face where mm -hmm. it's that dark line. So even though it's a little inappropriate, like actual, um, you know, as the light would hit it, I don't care. These guys are chaos. Chaos doesn't care about your lighting structure. 
And, uh, and I thought it made their face masks look more cool and pop and make them pop a little more, a little more menacing. So, you know, there you go. There's that. There's, there's always room, right? I mean, there's a way to do something realistically and then there's a way to some, make something just look cool. Right. I mean, <laughs> that's right. There's no, there's no rules here, right? People, <laughs> you can do whatever the hell you want. If it looks cool, it looks cool. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, all I was doing was just keep, you'll notice these keep being on opposite sides of my, my work mat. That's because that's how I work. Like I put them over to one side as I go, right? Like if you look, it's like they're over on the right side, they're over on the left side. They just keep going back and forth as I'm painting them. Like pick up one, work on him, set him to the left, to the right, then move him back to the left and back to the right. They went back and forth like a hundred times. Um, here we, uh, so what we did is we hit the shoes with a 50-50 mix of black and German gray. We uh, picked out the bone. Uh, that's just a, like, I've got a pretty standard bone technique, which is just this kind of washed out here. You can't see it as well, but start with your Vallejo Game Air Bone White. Wash it with Seraphim Sepia. Re-highlight with Glazed Medium Bone White. 50-50 Bone White, Dead White, White Alone. And you just kind of keep them really thin every time, and you just glaze it up and glaze it up. So here, here's one for you. I, I picked this up. A while ago that I kind of like um, actually incorporating in some some like a yellowish brown into the bone almost uh, I like it's usually dark sand so I think Vallejo makes a dark sand mm -hmm. um, and I really like that as, as a base so just very similar to what you just talked about in terms of bone but the, the base color is is dark sand it's almost a little bit yellow low yellower and it gives that kind of like horn look instead of like just straight bone look Nice. Give that a go yeah, sometimes. horns do have that ruddy yellowness to them off, and that's, that's a good call. I'll check that out. Nice. I like it. Uh, let's see. What else happened on this step? Um, oh, also uh, picked out the little details like you can see back here. He, this guy has little ropes or not, uh, stringies in his leather band. Uh, before I did that, washed everything, all the browns down in Agrax Earthshade. Um, I, I, washes are a great last step. The shade colors from Citadel are a great last step if you want something like leathery, rough textured, right? Because that's what washes will make it look like. So we washed over all the brown pants. I'm just going to leave, this is just primer colored. Just highlight it a little bit with the airbrush and then washed over. And that's how it's going to end. And it keeps them neutral. It's easy. It saves time. That's one of the reasons I like colored primer when you're factory painting. You, If you have any piece that you can leave like that and just wash over, hey, that's, there you go, time saver instantaneously. Um, so yeah, there was that. And again, th this comes to to another quick point that like on these models, what are you looking at, right? I mean, the pants the pants are just brown. You, you you notice that they're done, but you don't really your eye isn't drawn to them. You're you're drawn to the flesh, the light colors, the reds, right? If you just look at this unit, it, that's not the part that you're focusing on, right? The part that you're focusing on is the skin that he spent more time on, right? So the the pants only having a, a highlight and a wash. They look like pants. They look like they should. Your eye is drawn to the part that you spent more time on. So it, it, overall, miniature looks great because you know he has a focal point that you're staring at, and as a unit, the whole unit looks great because it's complete. But you're focusing on the part that you spent more time on. Right. It's exactly right. Yeah. You don't want bright pants, right? You ever, you ever like when you see models that have super bright or or ostentatious pants, and your eyes are drawn there. You're like, whoa, that looks weird. Because sort of in daily life, how often do you stare at people's pants? I mean, I'm sure you, Paul, stare at, at you know guys' pants all the time. But most other than you. Most days, yeah. I don't really get anything else done. <laughs> so uh, over here. So then we did the gold. And uh, this was done with my new thing that I can't stop using, which is the Vallejo liquid gold, uh, the alcohol-based paint. This is actually the red gold. Uh, and I've, I don't think I've ever done something more annoying or frustrating in my entire life than use Vallejo liquid gold on an entire unit. Um, because alcohol-based paints evaporate really fast. And so, I mean, I was constantly getting more out, remixing it. Oh my God. So much. So <laughs> if like... They're awesome paints, but word of warning, you better be ready. You better be in it for the long haul on that one. Let me just say that right now. Um, you can also see here the silver has come back up in the, in the method that I described. So I, I like the transition. I 
I think I like silvers that have some other color in them, you know, a blue, a purple, a green, a brown. There's a lot of different washes or, or colors you can add in there. But, you know, steel rarely looks just steel colored, right? Yeah. So, all right. So there's that one. And, oh, let me... And then we were done. So what we did with the gold is I did wash it down and then re-highlight it. And then I just went to the individual stuff, like uh, the standard here. So the standard was a lot of fun. Um, we'll kind of zoom in on this guy here. It's not like it's it, it, it lost some of the detail of what you see in real life. But this was sort of the application of our blood uh, lesson, right? I didn't I didn't want to put blood all over these guys' weapons and stuff just because I'm not a huge fan of that. But uh, I very much liked the standard being kind of blood soaked. So this was like, as I was doing the whole red and stuff, the, the standard itself was done in just a base coat of dead flesh with a little gray fixed in, a uh, little wolf gray, which is a nice purple gray. And uh, just even that out. And then I went in and as I was doing the reds, you know, for their helms and stuff, I would just stipple it on to the, to the standard there down at the bottom. Then I thinned down that dead flesh gray way down and just glazed it and glazed it and glazed it a bunch of times to give and then re the red and then glazed it and re the red. I did that probably four or five times just to make it look like blood had soaked in, you know, hundreds of times into the standard. And then I just randomly spotted around uh, the dark green wash, the Ethonian or shade, sorry, the Ethonian camo shade and did it again with a little seraphim sepia and then glazed it again and then so on and so forth, just so it looked like it's kind of moldy and kind of dirty and, and, you know, just all mixed throughout. Some of that got kind of washed out by the picture, but it's uh, that's because those kind of color tonal variations are very subtle and don't show super well on pictures. Is that, um, is that the standard banner or is that the Beastman banner? That is actually the Beastman banner, yes. I, I, uh, I, I, he's got a sneaky little Beastman banner there that I put on him. Uh, just because I wanted a large flat surface, I honestly, it was one of the few things I didn't like. I do not like the base corn standard that comes with it. No. It's just like, it's just well, skulls, just skulls, basically. Well, I also like that the new the new single character model, the Lord Celestian or whatever. Yes, the, the one that's on foot. Mm -hmm. I I dig the model, except for the cape. They shredded the cape, and I don't know why. <laughs> yep. Like I, I looked at it and I was like, oh, that would have been gorgeous. Somebody would have like. I just imagine some of the painters that I've seen, like someone would have crushed that model. Like, I mean, would it, it would have been freaking gorgeous. Right. If there had been a big off. flat cake, you could freehand yeah. over. Yeah. It's just like, God damn it. Yep. Uh, I agree. I do not like the, the, um, that like stringy cape they've got. Right. I, I totally agree. Uh, and the last step was just doing a couple of little things, putting the dead guy's faces on here and such and uh, then doing the bases. And so the bases are very simple, just cork, uh, primed them. Obviously the models were not attached. So if we go and, and sort of look at these, like I just have them blue tacky down, they're all pinned at the foot. Like first thing I do when I put the models together is drive a pin into everyone's foot so they can be pinned down into the base when I want to pin them there. But for now it's just a pin and, and blue tack holding them down. And so that way when I want to do this, I could just have the bases alone, took them out, gray primered them, and then just ran up my lava combo, which is just, which literally runs through the entire Vallejo model color range, like whole red, red, flat red, scarlet red, orange, moon yellow, right? And just dry brushing that over and back and forth and over and over again up to get to that at that point. Um, before that on the gray, you just, you know, kind of dry brush on some, some lighter color gray and some white, some white gray and some white. and. Uh, Maybe a little Nuln oil if you're feeling saucy mixed in there. And then do the lava, and you're good to go. Where, where are the black edges, Vince? Where are the black edges? On the bases. The bases are gray. Yeah, they are. I, I, I tend to keep them that color. Like, I, I don't know. I like the I like gray in this case. All, all of my corn models have gray base edges, so I don't know. I well, kept them like that. Well, I hate all of them. <laughs> I do. I was lazy and forgot to clean them up. Though. I'll, I'll give you that much. Like you can see there. Look at that. Look at that laziness in that oh, swipe around there. Oh, A minus. A minus. Absolutely. It's unacceptable, that kind of stuff. Other little things went in and picked out, like the little, you know, um, the little 
uh, bolts, I guess, or some, whatever these are, you know, with gold on their helms and such. Well, so that's the other thing I found too, right, is it, it's so much easier to, to have a, 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 like, almost finished product and then go back and pick some stuff out to make it look a little better. You yep. know, you, you can see that you can see the finish line at that point, like, you know, getting it, getting it all base coated, getting it all, you know, damn near finished, and then going back through is always way, way easier than being like, let me finish all these details before I get anywhere, right? I mean, I do that, I do that to myself sometimes, and I'm like, God, I just should get this closer to being done, and then come back and do this because I'll be way more energized to do it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like at the end, I even did a few touch ups after these pictures just because I was like, eh, there's a few more things I noticed. Like I did a little more work on this, these dead face heads here and just little tiny things that I noticed. And I was like, ah, oh, this could come up. This could go down. You know, don't be afraid to touch a model a little more, right? Even if you think they're done, you, when you notice stuff, just, you know, that's, it's all good. Fine. You're allowed to do that to your model. So. Well, and then the thing is too, is, is people, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend this all the time, but you can actually seal a model and go back and finish stuff after that, right? I mean, yep. you notice something, you're you're not you're not screwed if you've already sealed the model. Like you can you can add stuff to it and it'll it'll adhere fine, it'll look okay. Like you can even reseal it after that fact. Like you're not gonna kill anything as long as you're not doing crazy layers of seal. Um so yeah, don't worry about that stuff. Agreed. Absolutely. So there you go. That was the uh, that was the factory line there. There's the factory line step by step for the blood reavers. I like there that. And you know, I, I I filled in I filled in the challenge early, Vince. You know, I, we haven't done it, and I, I thought we could you know chat about it a little bit later and stuff like that. But some future stuff with the show, I, I put in a challenge to make a tutorial. So that's that's in the challenge vlog. So I, I think you're well on your way to 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 that. There you go. All right. So painting a unit, unit one done. The other, you know, let me tell you, there was a, there was another little fun thing that happened with doing those blood reavers. Mm -hmm. And that was that one, I finished 20 guys and I was like, well, one biggest unit in the box done. Right. Like nobody else, there's no other pack of 20, anything in that box. And two, I was like, this is all the blood reavers I will ever need. And that is a good feeling. Like this is, that's a done unit, right? It's not, I don't need 40, 50, whatever. Like I, I will say that, man, is painting for fantasy can be soul crushing. Like I can see that barrier that barrier to entry, that barrier to entry, like getting a fully painted army, that can crush some people, right? If you if you have like a perfectionist attitude or anything of the sort, like you're gonna get in there and be like, I need fifty Savage Orc Biggins. Fuck my life. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's uh, you decide to click Skaven, and then you realize what a horrible, horrible mistake you've made. <laughs> yes, only four hundred clan rats to go. Exactly. God damn it. <laughs> and Where then it's on to the one. Then it's on to the storm vermin and the uh, 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 keep going. Okay. God uh, damn it. Prime brown, prime brown, more earth colors. <laughs> <laughs> you know when I do, all, I'm going to uh, with all the Sigmar guys. I'm gonna do all them. I'm gonna collect that full army. I've already got another box of the uh, liberators on 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 order to pick up tomorrow, and uh, I've got six more of the angels coming in. I, I ordered a bunch of those already from the from the bit sites out of the box. So we're gonna have like nine I, I of those angels. I mean, there's there's some good deals. It seems like people have been shredding that box up. You can get some pretty good deals on the units. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. I got those angels out of steel, an outright steel. I mean, you probably I, got them for what, like seven, eight bucks? Uh ten. Ten for three, yeah. yeah. Which is that's cheap, man. That's for cheap. Those models? Yeah, yeah. We're getting it. So I mean, I might pick some up. So I'm going to convert all mine to be Bretonium. That's I've decided. We're going. We're going. These are going to be the Grail Marines. That's what's going on here. So it's the Grail cast. Uh, so I might take that Lord, the uh, the Lord Celis Castellan Re Relictor. That's what he is. That's the guy you're talking about with the skull head and the standard. Uh, I might take that dude and uh, cut off those little those little capey stringy things and just green stuff a full cape onto him. Yeah, green stuff capes are pretty easy to do. Well, the other guy I didn't. I got so mad because the other guy, the banner bearer, is that was that the one, the relictor? Is that what yeah, you're the relictor, about? the 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 good guy banner bearer. Yes, the good guy, good guy banner bearer. Why in God's name did you give him a skull head? Come on. <laughs> uh, he's supposed to in his backstory. He was he's actually like dead. He's legitimately a dead guy. Yeah. 
God. I don't know. I don't know why. It, aesthetically, that that irks me. Every time when they do something like that, it's like, big gold shiny goodness, angel deadhead. What? Right. Like, no, that's all right. My guy won't have that head anyway, so there you go. All, all the heads shall be swapped. There will be none of these face masks. On any of my uh, on any of my stormcast, yeah. on any of my grail knights. All Let's right. Size so heads, so you can swap them out with whatever you want. Yep, exactly. Super easy. Uh, all right. So, what did did you? Yeah, I, I I know I certainly enjoyed painting all those guys. I'm I'm looking at them now. I'm like, oh yeah, those guys are great. I feel good about having them done. Wait, what do you you feel the same? You happy with your uh, with your dude so far? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I mean, I'm totally happy with the progress. It, it, it's really nice to to get there. Um, I have some scenic bases I got from Micro Art that I'm gonna go with. So I got a little bit more work my way there. But I, again, I, I think I'm um, I'm at a good point for for how much time I put in. I, I'm I'm happy with where they're at. Yeah, you know, there's there is an understated value to unit painting, and here it is, folks. So let me let you in on the secret. You ready? It is going to be hell. It is going to be like war. When you paint, I, I the most I've ever factory painted at a time is 53 guys. Okay, I did 53, a unit of 53 people all at once over a three-day period. And that's probably 30 hours plus of work in those three days. Okay. And it was hell. <laughs> there were moments in there where I was like, I want to die now. But I kept painting. Maybe I stepped away for a minute or watched a video or something on YouTube, but I kept painting. And here's the thing. At the end of it, there are, I would rank it right below, like, maybe having your first child, getting married, having sex, finishing a unit of 53 guys. It's right in that range. Uh, it yeah, is. Like finish time, you're like, oh, my God, yes. Exactly. When you look at what you have wrought, and see those that massive unit done. It is a rewarding feeling that is just hard to equal in, in the world of miniature painting. It is yeah. unbelievably rewarding. I still to this day remember my unit of 18 ogre bulls. And I was just like, oh my god, they're done. Yes. You <laughs> want to like high five. You need somebody there to high five, right? You want to be like, come on, right up there. And you get to a point with some of them, I mean, even as someone, I really consider myself very detail oriented, and almost to a fault a lot of times with, with painting. And it <laughs> towards the end of the unit, you're just like, "Fuck it, don't care, don't care, detail, detail, good, yeah, you're done." <laughs> <laughs> so, with let's uh, let's transition off that into our our main topic. So we talked a lot about doing a unit, and I don't think there's anything more important when you're doing a unit. Or, or an individual model, or a big monster, or anything, then pre-planning, right? Thinking about the thing before you put paint to model. Now, sometimes you can just put paint to model and that's okay, but if you're gonna do 40 dudes, uh, or gals, uh, you better think about how that's gonna look before you start. Because otherwise you're gonna be going back, doing the same work over and over again. So- Logistically banging 40 dudes is pretty hard. It's, uh, it is pretty tough. It is pretty tough. It's pretty. It's pretty tough. Yes. So, walk us through the pre-planning of what you do when, when you're staring down, you know, this sort of challenge, right? So, so Paul, what what are your pre-planning steps? What do you do? So, I I do not do this properly all the time. It, it, as I said when we were going through this, you know, I stuck the face masks on. Should not have done that. Learning experience. And I've said this, you know when we did the dwarf a couple weeks ago, I had this giant beard and I, I did all this intricate freehand filigree on the chest piece and covered it with a beard. I mean, I, I'm certainly not perfect in this sense, but those are all examples of why this is crazy important to do in terms of not wasting your own time and not getting aggravated as hell. I think from the very start, it, it should really be about assembling the miniatures. Um, a lot of miniatures right now come with tons of options. And I think that that's inherent. Obviously, we're hobbying. So you have to think about what you want to assemble the model as to begin with. And we're not just talking about a finished project out of the box, right? You have to build these things. So I think initially what you want to do is look at the model. Is anything overlaying, you know, when you assemble something, right? You know, you, we usually with GW will have, like, you know, two halves of an arm. And those things go together. 
you're always pretty safe to glue those together, right? If they make a cylinder or something like that, you can stick that together. But before you glue like an arm on, or before you glue a mask on or a shield on, make sure you really stare at that model and go, what am I going to want to paint out of this? You know, it's probably going to cover most of his chest torso area. Do you care, right? I mean, is this a, is this a 50 man block where you don't really give a shit. All they're going to see is the shield anyway. Cover that thing up then. But if you have something like a character or something sitting on a stone or something, some big impressive model, and you put that shield on, and you got some stuff back there that you can see that you're not going to be able to get at now, I think that those are really important starting points before we even, even touch the paint aspect. And yeah, you won't be able to play with it, you know, your model immediately, but I think you're going to be much happier painting and much less frustrated if you can afford I mean, if that's your first army and you want to play the game, slap your stuff together. Um, but most people got friends that aren't going to model if it's like half half assembled, right? You can put the bodies on the bases and be able to play with that more so than, than worry about it. I mean, what, what are your feelings on that, Vince, what, before we even get to the painting stage? Oh, absolutely agreed. Like, here are the basics for me of things you never pre-assemble. I never stick shields to arms, right? Just because... And that's just not about a matter of getting behind. Even on, for me, even on, like, when I did my Bretonian, like, men at arms like, truly the definition of, like, troops I don't give a hoot about, right? Like, whatever. Um, I, because, and, and here's really why. It is so much easier to paint that shield when you can lay X number of them down on a flat surface and just paint them, right? Like, you're, you're painting on an even flat surface. You don't have to be turning them around. You can just do that shield all the way around, like you can lay 20 of them, 40 of them out on that flat surface and go. So shields, never on arms. I mean, unless they're already pre-attached, in which case, whatever, you're screwed. So like scaven slaves out of the island of blood, right? Whatever, that's fine. But there's nothing behind them anyway, so who cares? Yeah. Um, number two, knights to horses. Nope, never. M mounts to riders in general, I think yes. is the thing, right? Yep. Never stick that bad boy on there because you know those feet or... Lance or something's going to be just right in the way of some shit you want to do. Yep, absolutely. Keep them separate. You don't, because one, there's not even an excuse of like, I need to have this to have it on the table. Like whatever, if you got a dude on a dragon and you put the dragon down and say, this is my dreadlord on a dragon. Nobody's going to be like, well, you don't see a dreadlord, right? Like, I mean, if yeah. it's a tournament or something, you're, you're whatever, fine. but you should be painting that anyways. Uh, so well, half, half those guys hook in pretty well, right? I mean, yep. I can pretty much sit, I mean, hell, with my thunder tusks and stuff like that for ogres, you can just stick that model on there, and he hangs out there just fine enough for, you know, playing sake without being glued. Yep, absolutely. Now, um, I'm going to say quick on the flip side of this before I forget. Yep. Times when you may not have an option. Um, I found this a lot with the new GW clan packs. Beautiful models, but... Um, they tend to have seam lines or the mold lines will go together right down a crucial thing. So like uh, sometimes, you know, a shoulder pad will be made up of two halves yep. and that's going to give you a mold line right down the middle and you cannot keep those apart and glue them together afterwards, right? Because that, that gap's going to be there. It's not going to work anyway. You need to glue that together and paint it and fill it and clean the mold line beforehand. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, which is a thing in this in the Age of Sigmar, by the way. There's a lot of shoulder pads that meet halfway exactly how you're talking about. Um, <coughs> the uh, Another one for me that's like, if you can leave off a cape and do the cape separately, if that's a possibility for the model, always a good idea. Not always a possibility, but if you can, that's a definite. Um, the other one, and that's for people, especially with like this Skaven crap back here. <coughs> so inorganic models. And here's what I mean by that. If you've got a person, like what you said, the cylinder, right? When I glue an arm together, my arm is all the way around. There's no inside to my arm, right? I'm not painting anything inside of it. But those things like the Screaming Bell and the Warp Lightning Cannon, those are just frames. They're inorganic frames that have an inside to them, right? I, ha I have a challenge right now. If someone could paint a goddamn Doom Wheel after it's assembled fully, with utter detail, I will buy and paint you something. <laughs> right. It's just impossible, yeah. Like, it's never going to look as good as if you left it aside. When I did my Doom Wheel, I actually did mine on the sprue. Like, I painted the whole thing on the sprue and then put it together. 
Uh, so I, I like, I, I barely sub assembly it. I think I pulled like the guy off the sprue and stuff like that. Like the chair I took off and put together. Right. I mean, like it was, it, it was very little even sub assembly there. So inorganic things that have insides. Exactly. Doom wheel. Skaven has a ton of this, by the way, warp lightning, plate claw, screaming bell, doom wheel, all that nonsense. Right? I mean, yeah, and, and it's going to be especially apparent in, you know, the other systems that we don't play that all again, 40 K comes to mind with all this power armor and stuff like that stuff that clamps over top of things. Uh, they have been doing it a lot more again with the fantasy clam packs where, you know, you'll have something that sort of flows over the top of something else. So, you know, uh, some wisping piece of cape will come over the top of something else. And, and that's sort of difficult to do. Whenever you have layers to to the model, it's, it's very challenging. Yep. So I totally agree with you on that. So that's my that, that's my that's my pre planning modeling set aside of examining that. What's your next step? What do you do next? You're, next we're step, still not to painting, right? So what are we doing next? We're still not to painting. Um, you know, usually this actually happens probably before I even buy a model, um, because I like to, you know, I. I inadvertently think about it from the box art, and obviously that's why they put the box art on there. Um, what I kind of want them all to look like when it's done in terms of color scheme, and I sort of kind of go researching the model, um, you know, how, how people have, have done with it and, and what they've done with it, and sort of start staring at the model. And, like, every time I, I look at the model, I go, what draws my eye first? Or, or what's the cool little bit that I keep looking at? And that's sort of the first thing I, I look for. It's both, you know, do some research on the model, see what other people have done with it. Don't necessarily copy them. Copy them if you want to. Hey, that's fine. If that's your thing, you know, you just want to paint it. It's certainly, especially when you're learning, it's very easy to follow someone. Step-by-steps are great for learning to paint. Um, and then again, looking at the model in its bare plastic and seeing what keeps drawing my eye. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, the, my, my general first step is... You stare, I, I sit there, I do the same thing, you're exactly right. I sit there and I stare at the model, right? And I'm like, what's the detail? What are the pieces? What are the components? I start thinking about colors, right? And my color triangle of like, if this is going to be color X, what else is going to be that same color? Am I going to have a valid color triangle situation, right? Well, what so are going to be my neutral yeah. tones? Usually what I do is, yeah, you can, you can definitely start playing with the color wheel. I mean, this may or may not be the correct way, but usually what I do is I go, what would be a badass color for this one thing? You know what I mean? This one thing I look at, and I'm like, I want that armor to be blue or something, right? And then I just sort of branch out from there and then go to the color wheel and go, all right, well, I could go complimentary today, you know, go, uh, do some blue and purples or some, you know, cooler greens or something like that. You know, do some compliments like that on other pieces. But usually I, I start with that one piece and go, I want that thing to be X color or to give this feel. Right, absolutely. And then my next step is hit the internet, man. Google image search. I spend so much time on Google image searching. I search for that model, but I also look at like art, right? When people have drawn it in, in the books and stuff, I look through the book art. All of those are sources of inspiration. And, you know, when you're dealing with almost any of these models, the reality is people probably painted it before you. Oh, yeah. and, and I, I, again, like you said, I very rarely copy, but I oftentimes will springboard off of it or use it as inspiration, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm not going to pretend like all my, my uh, models are original, right? I mean, even a lot of times I'll, I'll browse. Look, all right, so I'm just going to pitch this out right now. If you haven't been on coolminiornot.com, coolminiornot.com, you need to look at this place. It's just an encyclopedia of painted miniatures, all rated, so you can look at, you know, Golden Demon quality ones, or just your average Joe quality ones. It's just a library of painted miniatures. I will guarantee you that you can find any GW miniature painted on there. Um, probably most Horus and War Machines. Pretty much any popular war game will be on there. A lot of custom stuff. You can, you can draw tons and tons of inspiration off that site. Um, and, and again, uh, like I've gotten ideas for themes. So I've seen someone do, you know, hey, this monochromatic piece, or hey, this hot and cold piece, and I sort of look at that concept of what they did and then take that and adapt it to another miniature or something like that, you know, see if I can execute something similar. And that's that's totally reasonable. I mean, people, artists, real artists get their inspiration from, you know, all sorts of things, you know, from nature to other people to, to you know, experiences. So I think it's totally viable to, to go and look at some, some of what other people have done. Yep. 
So we've got our, we know how we're going to break up the model, what we're going to assemble, what we're not, what our sub-assemblies are. We've picked our color scheme. We've, we've drawn our inspiration. What's, what, where are we at now? Where are we with pre-planning? What's your next step? <laughs> where was my next step? Um, Cause I know what mine is. I can go if you, if you like, I'll, I'll, I'll jump up on this one. My next step is thinking about what I, I know my colors, what goes under those colors, right? Mm -hmm. So my next choice is how am I priming this thing? What color am I priming it in? How much am I doing with Zenithal highlighting, right? Am I, is my color scheme going to really be suited to doing some good Zenithal highlighting where I can rely on that heavily? Or do I, do I just need to hit it with like some light Zenithal to just get the basics down? Uh, that kind of stuff because those kind of choices are really important. I used a lot of different primer colors and I vary it heavily based on what the model is going to look like. If it's all going to be in reds and golds, so I'm going to have brown parts like I did with that unit. That's a brown. If I'm doing my skeletons, my tomb kings, they're probably getting a bone white primer. If I'm doing something that's mainly purple or or something like that, that's probably going to be in a black and black, gray, white zenithal color scheme, right? Just all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I, I probably do that a lot more subconsciously. I don't think that that's a, a really pre-planned -pre thing for me. Um, and I think that's great that you think about that. Again, uh, a lot of times this, this starts to fall apart. My my best laid plans, this is usually the point where I'm still I'm still holding on to that one piece is why I painted that miniature, right? I have that thing that I'm looking at on that model going, this thing is going to look this way. And normally, not, not always, I'd say it's probably 50-50. I get there and I start painting that one piece, right? I mean, you know, like you said, it depends on the color choice, but this is sort of, you know, the main color I've been going for. And I start on that one focal point. And half the time I go, yeah, this is starting to look the way I want to. And then it'll, the miniature kind of flow out from there. Or the other time it kind of goes, well, this is not what I wanted at all. <laughs> and then it sort of goes back to pre-planning and, and sort of fall back mode. Um, so this is usually where where my plan tends to fall apart, you know, when the, when the uh, rubber meets the road, as they say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, we kind of briefly mentioned it, but I think we, maybe it's worth drilling in on. And that's fillet scraping those mold lines, you know, cutting off those extra pieces, filling those gaps. That's not to be underestimated. That's still in your, basically, you're, you're not putting paint to model yet. And it's an important step. We've talked about it before, whether you're using green stuff, whether you're using something like the plastic putty, which this is, this is my big, I'm a big fan of this when it comes to like, you know, uh, just little cracks and things like that, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, other things in there, if you're thinking about conversions, you know, if you're, if you're going to convert the model in any way, that's also happening in this pre-step, right? You need to think about what pieces are you converting, what alternates are you using, that kind of stuff. Do you tend to go, what, what do you tend to, to crack fill with as it were? What, what's your, what's your go-to for that? Um, it really depends on what, what I'm looking at. Um, a lot of times if it's something like a joint and like a hip, I'll actually add a little bit of glue, little extra glue to sort of fill that in and then actually kind of carve over that with a hobby knife to sort of use the glue as the joint. Um, but I'm, I'm really, I'm a big green stuff, right? I actually, I haven't tried what you just held up. So I, I was actually just jumping on eBay to kind of grab one. <laughs> Um, it's awesome. Once you go to plastic putty for like simple cracks, you'll never go back. It's water based. You just drop it in there. Uh, you can just take something slightly wet, wipe it over the top, smooth it out, then just sand it down. You're good. So uh, <laughs> I would not recommend this. This is this is the show of of you know probably proper way. Um, if I'm base coating, I will let some paint thicken up on my wet palette and I will actually use that sometimes as, as, as uh, a crack filler. Um, I wouldn't recommend that cause that can get ugly sometimes. Um, but I, I have, I have certainly done that. Um, but a, a lot of it, especially when I really care will be, will be green stuffed. Um, you can definitely way more malleable and get it where you really, really want to. Um, so that's certainly for, cause you know, sometimes you get it, especially in fantasy miniatures, you get the, the joint on something that's, you know, rounded in, in even with, with paint or some, or like, you know, I haven't tried your, your putty, but like getting with glue or something doesn't really work. Kind of leaves this weird, weird rut. And, you know, you can kind of mold the green stuff in the same contour as the model itself. Like even if it's not exact, it usually looks a little more fluid than other means. 
Right. Absolutely. So I think after all that, you know, I, I think then probably you're pretty ready to put paint to me. I think that's probably all my pre-planning steps. Any Anything else uh, that I'm not doing that you're doing? I don't think, oh, um, washing resin models. Uh, oh, yeah, good, good call. That's my personal preference. I think that's just something to start with, sort of basic modeling technique, but uh, people tend to always seem to be shocked that I do that. Um, ever since I tried painting a fine cast model and and realized that, you know, if you've ever if you've ever <laughs> painted a resin model and, and sort of put wash on it and just beads up instead of pulling out, that means that there's some lubricant on that, that resin model and it needs to be washed off. So you can basically rub off your primer with your finger very easily. Like if it's just sliding right off, you need to give that a good washing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, not, not a bad idea for a lot of different minis, but especially like uh, Reaper Bone stuff, uh, absolutely wash, you know, kind of give them a, a light scrub with maybe just a little bit of dishwasher soap because you've you got to get rid of that mold release. That's what's killing you right there, right? That's the, that's the lubricant <laughs> you're running into. Good call. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then it, then it goes, uh, usually for me, straight to the airbrush. Um, just uh, priming whatever I want and then base color with whatever is the majority of the model. Yep, absolutely agreed. That's 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 my uh, that's my first step as well. Uh, I just got my new airbrush and I haven't tried it yet, but it's it's coming. It's sitting over there. What do you got? I see it's like right there. Uh, I want an eclipse, man. You should have talked to me. Oh, Vince, you never talked to me. I, I, I'm sorry. What you going to send me one? Uh, I actually have one sitting in my door. Nice. Well, that's okay. <laughs> It was a it was a good thing I wanted to get it. I've been wanting to get a new one for a little while. So yeah, it, it, you know. that's a phenomenal airbrush. You're gonna love it. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. It's gonna it's gonna get broken out here very soon. So uh, yeah, there you go. So hopefully those pre planning steps help all of you. That's ours. If you've got additional ones that we didn't say, hey, put them down below. Throw them down below. If you got more thoughts on you know factory painting, what what's the biggest you factory painted? What have you what do you do? Uh, to, to, you know, knock out that amount of work. Um, a little less important in, uh, in the age of Sigmar, but still something very valuable, uh, to be sure. Whether you're doing the, the same tips and tricks are, are good, whether you're, if you're doing five models or if you're doing 50, uh, often all the, especially all the pre-planning stuff we've said. All right. So let me, uh, let me take a look at some, there was, uh, Merrick had, uh, had left a comment. And uh, he said he's working on his lizard men for Age of Sigmar right now and loving it. Glad to hear it, Merrick. I'm, I'm glad we're we're helping you helping you get some hobby work done. Uh, you know, Merrick had the uh, the um, the uh, uh, he was going about that epoxy thing, and he put up a tutorial on that. Did you get a chance to watch that? No, I didn't. Uh, I all of our viewers. Merrick, you can you can probably link to him off of his comment, which is somewhere down here. And on his channel, he has a tutorial he put together of like basically to sort of using this kind of epoxy to replicate your own little mini parts, and it's awesome. And he's Merrick, awesome. you've done like fantastic, amazing work with it. So highly recommend that. Good stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like we need to. Sorry, you know, you know, I just, I just real quick, I, I think that I keep forgetting to do. I need to do this with that if we ever get that basing challenge. Yes. Well, have you ever seen the the diorama bases where they do the epoxy where it's like like looking in the water? Yes. Like it's actually below water. I need to, I need to learn how to do that. All right, there you go, Merrick. I think what we we need to have you on the show sometime. We're going to do the mid segment. We're going to do this segment, feature segment about doing that thing. That, you know, like I, I, I would love to have you walk through maybe like live and talk to us about it. So. Hit me up, man. That's uh, yeah, I want to. I want to talk about it. We 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 want you on the show to, to share that technique even more. But until that time, go watch his tutorial. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it after you're done with this. Not this exact minute. Later. Also, uh, Tom, my co-host of Warhammer Weekly, left me a message that's just that said uh, to tell you, Paul, that uh, you can send him the the airbrush if you want anytime. He'll he'll gladly accept it. I told him to piss off. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh with that uh anything else we have to say about pre-planning before we move on to determining next week's challenge or next two weeks challenge i guess 
I don't think so. Um, again, same rules really apply for finishing a model as finishing assembling a model. Uh, don't <laughs> don't rush anywhere, right? <laughs> Leave some of the pieces apart. Step away from it. If you've been if you've been building, you know, sixty five guys, you know, have been scraping mold lines for seven hours. Maybe step away for a minute so that you don't, you know, glue it together and realize that you've left that one mold line that you're going to realize after you start painting. Um, I would certainly, again, this is a hobby. It's supposed to take time. So y use yes. that time. <laughs> I, that's, that's, that's a good point. Yes. Don't be afraid of the time. It's, it's okay. It's all right. It's, that's, it's, what, that's what we're here for. We're here to put, play with toy soldiers and waste some time. There you go. Wasting time since a long time ago. I don't know, since some year. Pick a year. Since whenever you started the hobby. There you go. Since we had more time. Yes, absolutely. All right. So, Paul, would you like to, to read the uh, the challenges? Uh, sure. So, let me see if I can just hop in the Google Drive real quick. I will say, Vince, that I, I posted this challenge up to my my gaming group. So we had okay. we had a bunch of people going for trying to paint uh, a whole unit, trying to oh, get nice. answers. I'm trying to get answers about uh, who did what. I posted up my failure today, so <laughs> we'll see if any of <laughs> the other gaming group made it. That's good. You should you should do all of their their pictures together in like a big mega post on the PMP. Sure. Um, all right. So all right. So for challenges. Our first challenge, number one, basing challenge. So we're going to go it above and beyond on the bases. Number two, freehand capes. Number three, a unit filler, which makes us sad and, you know, remembering the good old times. <laughs> Four, F this color yellow. We're going to get around to doing some yellow. Five, gems. Six, painting pure white. So we have, we have two, two colors on there that, that are very challenging in their own ways. And uh, uh, no airbrush for the white challenge. No, I don't think any airbrush for the yellow challenge either. Absolutely not. I actually just painted up some yellow. I, I, f I found a technique I like. I hope we get that one. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, ethereal painting, spooky ghosts. I like that. Um, Vince was painting up some uh, more tarks and came up with that. Very original. Um, number eight, true metallic metal. It also could be a fun one. Nine, make a tutorial. So Vince and I are going to do whatever we want, but we'll make a tutorial on how we do it, which I think is a good content upping uh, deal. And then number 10, that big mother, chariot base or bigger, go big or go home. So is that like a 32 by 92 in the new world? Like, does, does this base count? And, no, and, uh, you, and, no, you cannot paint the stupid cat thing. Is that does that base count now? Is that okay? No, no stupid cat thing. You shut your face, calling it stupid. He's beautiful. He's a pretty lady. He is. Don't you insult him like that? He's a beautiful cat dragon thing. All right. So as usual, we will determine the next challenge with the orange die of destiny. So shall the die shall be cast. Here we go. You ready? Oh, there we go. All right. I don't even know what it is, but the, uh, this, the fate has been set. Ta da. Can you... Is that a two? That is a two. It's reversed, but it is a two. Free handing some capes. Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. Lordy, Lordy. I Look who's. Don't, I don't know what I'm going to do for that. Well, I just said I was going to green stuff some cape on that guy, and so. Your giant you cat guy has a cape. You yes. dumb dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, six out of these challenges, I guarantee you, you would have done that freaking cat thing. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that cat guy, so he's high on my list. What can I say? He's, he's going to get done. I would have shoved him in anywhere. <laughs> unit filler, cat guy. Yeah, he's, he sits in the middle of the unit. He's, it's cool. It's he's fine. Done. It's a cat guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All good. So, there we are. We're going on to – this is our eighth show, Vince. How do you feel about I that? know, right? It's crazy. For, for biweekly, we, we're really staying on it. Boy, we're responsible. Look at us. All right. All so right. Tapes. That's going to suck. <laughs> Freehand capes. All right. So we're going to do 
some designs. Paul, you're going to crush me in this one. That's what I predict. I predict right now Paul cleans my clock. You can join <laughs> us in two weeks to see how bad I get beaten in this. <laughs> well, this is going to be a this score one. one for the good guys. Yeah, this is going to be the most one-sided the challenge been like Actually, about, about painting models, so Vince has been crushing me. As soon as we get away from <laughs> actually painting models, win! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Freehanding capes. As always, we'd love to see you freehand some capes, too, out there. So if you've got... Or, or freehanding anything. So if you happen to be working on some Bertonians... You know who we got? We got? We got Victor Case, right? Yes. I'm calling you out, buddy. We want to see what you got. Oh, my God. What, do you want to be embarrassed? Is let's that what you're it. aiming at here? Victor, let's see what you got, bro. Oh, boy. Yes. I Well, I, I second that. Victor did amazing, amazing freehand when he was doing his Harlequins. For anybody who wants to see something better than anything probably will produce, certainly that I will produce, uh, you can go look at Victor's channel and follow his Harlequin path. And look at some of the freehand he did, like with the skulls and the designs and the flames. It's mind-boggling. So uh, after you watch our next show, or maybe before it, you can watch a excellent tutorial on that, and then you can see what I do, and you can be like, oh, yeah, okay, I understand. Now I feel better about it. You might be intimidated by how good Victor does. You can see the crap that I'm about to put up, and you'll be like, oh, no, I can totally achieve that. That's fine. So that's, <laughs> that's, there we go. We'll aim low. All right. Keep expectations low. You can only be surprised. <laughs> there you go. All right. Any any closing thoughts, Paul? Uh, no. Get to paint some miniatures. Look, the, the gaming gaming may be in turmoil, but hobbying is always in vogue. That's right. I got some. I got some little. Oh, really are. I got the actual blood knights all put together, ready to go. Excited about those guys. And then, it's, you know, maybe the cat guy will be next. Got my converted Korgorath with his giant head. See? Giant head Korgorath. There look, I'm just, look, I, I'm so excited. I got I to gotta show you just because I'm so excited. You just can't hide it. I just can't. Look, bro. I mean, come on. They're orc space pirates. Come on. The Flash gets. It, they are dead shooty. I've heard that. It's freaking orc space pirates. Get out of here. You can't hate that. I don't think we can close on a better message than that. Orc space pirates, you can't hate them. Oh. There you go. All right, thanks, everybody. As always, we'll see you next time.